So now that you understand about vector spaces and inner products in a general and abstract way, you are finally ready to learn something absolutely amazing. I'm very excited of being able to finally showing this to you. I'm about to give you what I think is the most mind-blowing example of a vector space, different to everything you have seen so far. Not only is it fascinating mathematics, but it's actually very useful. It's used a lot in physics and engineering. Let's look again at the axioms for a vector space. There is something that you have been using in maths all the time, which perfectly fits into these axioms. The set of all mathematical functions f of x. Do you agree? You can add two functions together f of x equals u of x plus v of x, and the result is another function. You can scale a function with a number, f of x equals lambda u of x, and the result is another function. Take a moment to realize that the sum and scalar multiplication of functions fulfill all of the required rules. And now think about what this means. It means that from a purely abstract point of view, functions f of x are vectors. They are, mathematically speaking, the same as a geometrical vector. This means that functions have some sort of a length and a direction. Also, given two functions, it's like having two vectors. You can do linear combinations of them. You can find the distance between them. You can project one into another. You can do everything that we have studied with vectors, but with functions. We could even extend this further to functions of multiple variables, such as, for example, the wave function of an electron in spacetime. But you have not learned neither the maths nor the physics for this yet, so let's keep it simple here and think only of functions of a single variable f of x. But keep in mind that in the future, you will use it for much, much more. The only difficulty you face with this analogy between vectors and functions is the number of dimensions of this vector space. It can be shown that you can build an infinite amount of functions that are linearly independent of each other. Therefore, you can build an infinite basis, which is made up of an infinite number of vectors to span the space. And this means that functions live in an infinite dimensional vector space. But our axioms and our proofs never said anything about the numbers of dimensions having to be finite, so we can work with an infinite number of dimensions. Let's try to understand how it is possible that a function can be seen as a vector. Actually, there is a very easy way to understand this. Consider the vector space of all functions f of x defined in the interval between x equals a and x equals b. Here is an example of one such function living in that space. Note that a and b could be minus infinity and plus infinity, but for now, let's take them as some real values. As a rough approximation, you could describe this function by looking only at a discrete finite set of points, like this. These are the points where we take a sample of the function and record its value. Let's call these x values the sample points, x1, x2, etc. And the values of the functions at each sample point can be called our samples, f1, f2, etc. Then, you could say that the function is fully described by a collection of n values, corresponding to f1, f2, all the way up to f of n, which we can write as a vector. Of course, the approximation would have been better if we had used more sampling points, that is, more dimensions in our vector. In the limit in which the number of points is infinite, you would be exactly describing the functions as an infinite dimensional vector. So now you understand. In that limit, you would not be able to write the vector as a list of discrete numbers f1, f2, and so on, because there would be an infinite amount of numbers to write. Instead, however, you can simply write the vector as the function f of x itself, interpreting the value f of xi as the coefficient corresponding to the sample point xi. Therefore, we are describing the set of all infinite sample points in their interval a to b.
but let's go back to the simple case of finite dimensions as an approximation. At the end we will make the limit when n goes to infinity, but for now we have the function written as a vector of n values at the sample points. As we know from our traditional geometrical vectors, vector components are always interpreted as the coefficients of a certain basis. So what would be the basis in the case of functions? The basis would be a set of functions that have a value of 1 at each of the n sampling points, and a value of 0 elsewhere. Then, the vector notation represents a linear combination of the basis functions, which indeed will give you back a good approximation of the original function. The approximation gets better as we increase the density of samples, because the basis functions become narrower. The number of basis functions therefore increases, as they need to cover the whole interval between a and b. The dimension of the vector, which is equal to the number of basis functions used to span the space, therefore increases. In the limit when n goes to infinity, the basis functions become infinitely thin, and are infinitely many, so we need to introduce a new notation. Instead of naming our basis functions as an ordered list, e1, e2, e3, etc., we now name the basis functions as e lambda, where the subscript lambda is a real number which represents the location of the infinitely thin non-zero value. Lambda is a real value instead of an integer, and it can take the whole continuous range of infinite values that exist between a and b, which produces the infinite basis functions. Instead of having a discrete set of individual basis vectors, we have a continuous infinite range of them. Following this logic, the usual linear combination used to describe a vector in terms of basis vectors cannot be a sum anymore. Instead, it becomes an integral. As a side note, it turns out that there is actually a name and a symbol for this infinitely thin function located at a certain x position. It is called the Dirac delta, and it is analogous to the Kronecker delta that we have seen earlier, but instead of working on integers, it works on continuous values. It becomes non-zero only when its argument is zero. The Dirac delta is a tricky thing. Mathematicians always remind us that it's not a proper function. However, it's incredibly useful for us. You should not worry at this stage about the details now, because the Dirac delta falls outside the syllabus for this module. You will study the Dirac delta in later mathematics courses. However, I'm going to write its properties here just to satisfy those of you who are curious. And don't worry, there will be no problems or questions about it in the exam. Please note that this basis of rectangular functions is only one possible basis amongst infinitely many in the vector space of functions. For example, we could use a basis based on powers of x, such as 1, x, x squared, x to the power 3, up to x to the power n. And in fact we already saw the possibility earlier when describing polynomials as vectors. Any smooth function f of x can be written as a polynomial via its Taylor expansion, and so we could write it as a superposition of those infinite basis functions. However, this is not a nice basis because the different powers of x are not orthogonal to each other, according to a definition of orthogonality that we will see later. So representing vectors with these powers of x is possible, but it's a bit like representing vectors in a clumsy non-orthogonal basis. Ok, we have seen that functions are vectors, and we have seen possible bases for describing them. What about the inner product? If we define an inner product in this space, then we could do all the things that inner products allow us to do. We could measure lengths of vectors, distances between vectors, and projections of functions into subspaces. Remember, in the xyz basis, the Hermitian inner product of vectors u and v was the dot product between u and the conjugate of v. The inner product is therefore the sum of the multiplication of each element in u 
with the conjugate of each corresponding element in V, and then adding all of the results together. What would this look like in our function vector space? We want to do the inner product between two functions, f of x and g of x. We can denote this by writing f and g between angle brackets. One way I could teach you to do this is to just give you the formula for the inner product and prove that it fulfills all of the axioms that the inner product has to fulfill. That is how all textbooks do it, and it's a perfectly valid way. However, I'm going to try a very informal and hand-wavy way of arriving at the result. I'm going to start from the n-dimensional approximation of the function with a finite number of sample points, and then do the limit when n goes to infinity. Hopefully, this helps you gain an intuitive understanding of how it works. Please don't worry about this explanation if some steps seem unjustified. The important thing is that at the end we will arrive at a valid inner product between functions which fulfills all the axioms. When the function is approximated as a finite sum of n orthogonal basis functions, then we can apply the usual equation for the inner product in terms of the components of an orthonormal basis, exactly as for 3D vectors. The inner product would then be the multiplication of the value of f at each sample point times the corresponding value of g, complex conjugate, at the same sample point, and then adding them all up together. Let's see that visually. We start with two functions, f and g, with their n values at the sample points. We look at the first sample point, and we record the value of f at this point, f1. We then multiply this value by the value of g conjugate at the same sample point, g1 conjugate. The resulting multiplication is f1 times g1 conjugate. This gives us a number. If we place this value at the location of the first sample point, and then we do the same multiplication for all other sample points, we arrive at the following list of values. But think about it. These values are just the sampled version of some new function, the function f times g conjugate. Now, following our analogy with the dot product, we need to add up all of the values. So what will happen in the limit when the number of samples goes to infinity? First, let's scale the result of the inner product by the amount delta x, the distance between sampling points. This scaling is perfectly allowed, as it does not break any of the axioms. It is a valid inner product. And it turns out to be a good idea because then, increasing the number of samples does not make the summation go to infinity. Instead, as n increases, the sum will tend to a fixed number. It will tend to the area under the curve, which we can calculate as an integral. So that's the answer for functions seen as infinite dimensional vectors. We define the Hermitian inner product for the space of functions in the interval a, b as the integral from a to b of function f of x multiplied by the complex conjugate of function g of x. I'd like to add a note about the complex conjugation, which is denoted as the superscript asterisk. What does it mean to conjugate a function? It means exactly the same as when conjugating a complex number. It means that we change the sign of the imaginary part of gx. If gx is a purely real function, then the conjugate of gx is equal to gx. This is a very nice definition for the inner product, which fulfills all of the axioms. In particular, it gives a very nice way for calculating the length of a vector in this space, doing the inner product of a function with itself. This is what we get. which is always greater or equal to zero, and is exactly zero only when the function f of x is zero everywhere. The zero function represents the origin in this vector space. Knowing how to do the inner product, there are many things we can now do with functions. We can check whether functions are orthogonal. For example, Consider the space of functions in the interval a, b equal to minus 1, 1. Let's consider the functions f of x equals 1 and g of x equals x. Are these two functions orthogonal in this space? 
We can check this by doing their inner product. The result is zero. So by definition, we can say that the two functions are orthogonal to each other. Of course, this is true as long as we have defined this particular vector space, considering this interval minus one to one, and using this particular definition of the inner product as this integral. What about f of x equals 1 and h of x equals x squared? Are they orthogonal to each other? Let's do their inner product. In this case, the result is not zero, so the functions 1 and x squared are not orthogonal to each other in this vector space. We could do all of the other things that the inner product allowed us to do. For example, we could do the projection of a function into the subspace defined as the span of another set of functions. We can do problems like those in class. So with this we reach the end of the video. Let's summarize what we learned. The inner product is an operation which can be defined in a vector space. It must follow certain simple axioms, and it defines the meaning of length of a vector and the meaning of orthogonality between vectors. When working with an orthonormal basis, the inner product gives us a very easy recipe to find the component of a vector in a certain basis vector, and also to find the projection of a vector into a subspace defined as the span of an orthonormal basis. We have also seen the following examples of inner product that fulfill all these conditions. First, our old friend the dot product, valid for vectors that are real. Second, our new friend the Hermitian inner product, very similar to the dot product but doing the complex conjugate on the second vector. This change allows us to use it with vectors that are complex. If the vectors are real, then this inner product is the same as the dot product, so we could say that this one is more general. Finally, we have seen a completely different example, the Hermitian inner product defined for function vector space, written as an integral. With this knowledge of n-dimensional vectors and how to measure things in them, we will now move to our next topic, transformations of vectors and matrices.